So let's review very quickly what we have achieved so far in the tutorial videos. Uh, we have one package called Antler and where we actually develop this particular grammar file and specifically we want to generate visitor methods from there. That's why we put labels over here. And then we got another package over here called expression. So this is to say what's the rationale of creating this package of classes over here. The uh, rationale is if you look at the uh, parse tree over here, each of the nodes here are of type, for example, program context, decoration context, or expression context or addition context. So these classes are actually from the Antler runtime library. Nothing wrong of using them. I'm just saying it's actually harder to really control them when you actually run into bugs. In that case, it will be much more difficult to actually debug them. However, if you can just create your, your own hierarchy of classes, like the diagram we showed you previously, like the design over here, we got basically a composite design pattern and client supply relationship that you learned from the previous software design course. So this is much better design in terms of software engineering. So that's something we would like you to have. So the idea would be we define basically two visitor classes, antler to expression, antler to program. So the goal for these two classes is to bridge between antler parse trees into model expression classes. So everything except for these two classes, they are the model classes. Of course, for your particular project, which might be much more sophisticated, for the example we are using for this tutorial series, your uh, model package may be more than one, and also the uh, inheritance hierarchy might be much more sophisticated. But I'm just want to give you some idea. You really want to separate between parse trees and uh, model expression cl uh, model class hierarchy, right? That's something you want to really uh, get yourself through this idea. So the idea will be the visitor will convert a tree, uh, the parse tree over here, into a structure like this for the objects uh, for, uh, instantiated by your model classes. Okay, let's go back here. So what's left uh, for this particular project over here? We are basically getting uh, most of the stuff done, but now it's really the critical moment. So far, we haven't seen any uh, test cases being executed on our compiler. So you don't exactly see what a compiler is. And also remember this particular flow diagram I talked about in the very first tutorial video. You can see basically what we have done. We have gone over all the classes over here for the Java, right? And there's only one, there's a, and still one more class that we want to talk about in this particular box, which is how we can create a console application, for example, to really run everything together. So that when a user pass an input file, they can actually run every, they can be run against by every, every class over here and then produce some interesting output for your compiler. That's something we haven't seen yet. And also number two, we want to do some proper error handling. I'll do that in the next video, but for this current video, let's do some main program, okay? which is not difficult. Okay, The most difficult part, of course, is to see how you can build from parse tree in, uh, from parse tree to build it uh, uh, into your model uh, expression object. That's the most tricky part. If you get it through, now you have done the most difficult part. Okay, so now let's go to uh, our Eclipse project here. I would like to create a new, uh, a, a new package. Okay. So right click on the source and say new package, and then let's say app, okay? You can also call it main, we'll call it root, it's up to you. I'll say app for now, application. Okay, under this new package here, I'm gonna create uh, one class with a main method. So I'm gonna say new and then class, and let me call that expression app, for example. You can think about this is your compiler. And this compiler app is actually going to combine everything together, combining the visitor, combining the parser, combining everything. Okay, And then I should have a main method over there. Okay, And that one, of course, is static. And there is one helper method I want to do first. So this helper method will be very similar for every application you're going to do for the compiler. So I want to mention that uh, first of all. Okay. So now this particular one, uh, let me make a private. I'll say private uh, static because I'm going to call that in the main method. So that should be static as well. Let's say it now depends on the grammar I'm talking about. You can see for this particular one, since I'm talking about a grammar called expression, so the parser will be of type expression parser. So now in this case, I should change the return type over here accordingly, but the code structure will be similar for, uh, 
almost identical for every application you might do. So I want to say expression parser, okay? So now I want to import it from the antler package, right? The, so uh, expression parser is generated in the uh, antler package. So just a parser objects, okay? So far we haven't really shown you the code for expression parser, but the generated code, the only two that's worth your attention for the visitor case would be just the two visitor classes, the base visitor and also the uh, expression visitor, only these two. But for expression parser, just know this is your class, okay? And then what you want to get a parser. So this parser is more like, like more like a main control program for you to uh, actually call all the various uh, parsing uh, procedures. Okay, you can take a look if you, you're uh, interested, but I think uh, as long as you know how the visitor methods work, you're fine. Okay, get parser over here, and then I want to pass a file name. Okay, over here. Okay, so now I'm gonna say uh, expression parser again. What type of the parser should be depends on the grammar. Okay, in that case, in this case, it's expr, so that should be expr parser. Okay, parser initially just no, and then we're gonna do something in the middle and then return the parser at the end. Okay, so now in the middle, I'm gonna do something. Basically, I want to initialize this particular parser objects by using a different string. Okay, I'll just write it down. So I will first use a class from Antler version four runtime library. So it's called char uh, string. Okay, singular. And then it should be from Antler version four. Choose the right thing. It's a char string singular. And then Antler v4 runtime. Okay, from there. And then I would say input is gonna be from some input string from another class. I'm gonna say char string. Okay, it's now plural. So it's char streams and then Antler version four runtime. Okay, choose that. And then you say from file name. And then I put, uh, put a file name over there. Okay, so now it complains because unhandle exception type IO exception. Okay, we're just gonna do a try and catch. So I can simply surround with try and catch. Okay, it completed codes for me. Okay, so now I got the input string. So now I'm gonna create Lexer. You can think about Lexer is gonna handle uh, recognizing the tokens. And I'm gonna create parser by using the Lexer. Okay, so these are the kind of like a logical flow. Okay, expression lexer, because now I'm talking about the grammar is called expr, so it should be expr lexer, okay? It's from the antler package, okay? You can see one is the expr parser, the other one is expr lexer, right? These are all generated. Every time you change your grammar specification, make sure you regenerate all the stuff, and these two, these classes will all be updated, right? That's why we put it in a separate package. And always this package here will should be, uh, should not be affected by any regeneration. Okay, lexer over here, let's call it lexer, is new expression lexer. And then we're gonna pass on input string, okay? So that's exactly the input I just created, right? Create an input string, create a lexer on the input string, and now we also need to uh, get a tokens. So what the lexer, the lexer is gonna uh, recognize all the token that's valid. So I can say common, another class, token, string okay make sure you choose version 4 over here okay choose that and then you're going to get tokens is new common token string and then i'm going to get the lexer okay so now once you get the token so now you can actually initialize a parser so now i can say parser which which is eventually going to return it will be new expression parser okay and then i'm going to put tokens over here Okay, that's about building the parser, and then I will just return the parser. As, uh, as far as the current video is concerned, that'll be it. Later on, we may have to extend uh, this block of code a little bit just to improve the error handling, but let's not worry about it for now, okay? For now, let me just finish something so I can we can do some quick testing on the compiler so you can see how everything works together. So this particular helper private method would be just identical between application to application. The only thing you have to change would be just the prefix for the generated class, depending on the name of your grammar, okay? Let me just go to, uh, let me just uh, write down notes for you, okay? So that uh, you wouldn't forget. Here, the types of parser and elixir are specific to the 
grammar name expr.g4, right? Because one is called expr parser, the other one is called expr lexer. Okay. So just remember the comments there. Okay, so now let's program the main method quickly. So if, at the end of the day, I would like to show you how you can run the program both on the console as a console application and also on the command line. So we better set up the command line arguments. So for those of you who never got a chance to see what might be the usage for this particular string args array over here. So today you will see, okay, in this video. So now I would say if the argument, basically you can think about the command line is going to be uh, an array of arguments. For example, when you run the antler four, uh, antler four program, when you say dash visitor or dash no listener, so that's actually one of the arguments. So it's just an array. So let's say we only, for our compiler, we only take one single argument for the file name. If arc.length, which is an array, if not equal to one, then we gotta report some error to the user. So we can say system.l. We can system system.error.println, doesn't matter. And then I'm gonna say usage file name, something like that. Okay, so you should really pass a file name in order to use our compiler. Otherwise, in this case, if the comp uh, there's only one single argument over here, so that means that should be, presumably that should be the file name. So what I will do is I'll say string file name should be args at position zero, right? Just an array over here. And then now I can retrieve the parser by calling this particular uh, helper method, right? So basically I retrieve the parser and then I try to parse the program. Expression parser and then and then I'll say parser is get parser over here and then the file name. Okay, so far so good. And then we're now going to basically start parsing. And the way to parse is like this. Oh, maybe there's something uh, is worth talking about. Okay, you can see uh, I said I shouldn't really look at the generated code. Let me take it back. Okay, you should look at the generated code for the parser. Okay, for this part. You can see over here, how many variables do we have? We got program here, we got decoration here, we got expression over here. As we said in the lecture, the standard way of implementing a parser is by, for every variable, for every non-terminal, we have a corresponding method. And these methods call each other, so they are mutually rec uh, recursive. You can review your lecture notes to see uh, this particular remark. Okay, so now that means in your, in the expression parser Java classes that's generated, there should be three methods called program, decoration, and expression. I'll show it to you quickly. So now if you go to expression parser over here, so if I look at the outline view, there are many, many things over here, but look at the public ones. You can see there is one called proc over here. Basically, this is the starting point because over here in the grammar file, okay, in the grammar file, you can see the proc is the sub variable. That's the very first production rule. So by convention, it's a sub variable. So the corresponding method, which is over here, uh, the corresponding method, which is over here, is the starting point for compilation. So as soon as you invoke this particular method, it's gonna start parsing whatever input file you pass to it. And also you got decoration, which is not the starting point, but it will eventually be called because they're mutually recursive. And also you got another one, which is expression, right? So you can see the point. All other methods you don't have to worry, right? Unless you really have to trace the code. Okay, let me close it. So now in order to parse the uh, program, so what I will do is I'll just say, uh, tell, I mean, write some comments for you. Tell antler to build a parse tree. Something like this. Okay, so basically as soon as you say proc, he's going to try, it will, it will attempt to build a parse tree starting from proc, uh, which is a star variable. Okay, uh, to build a parse tree, and also you will parse from the start symbol, which is proc. And now you're gonna say parser.proc. And that one there is going to return basically a parse tree. And program context is simply just one kind of the parse tree. Remember we said the type of this particular node here should be a program context. And program context is just a subtype of a parse tree. So what we can do is we can say the proc over here. So we should really capture its return value. 
and the way we do it is by saying parse tree and then make sure you uh, import it from antler v4 runtime okay so parse tree and then let me call it antler ast so i want to be very specific about whether there's a tree from you can think about in some way our object structure over here in the pink is also like a tree structure so i want to be very specific uh, very clear about either it's a tree from the antler side the green one or it's a tr object tree structure from our particular expression package you want to be very clear the pink one is much easier to work with and once you get uh get to the pink one you can feel free to uh, you can feel free to do lots of transformation from there but working on this for further transformation is very tedious and error prone and hard to work with okay so now what i will do is i will go for basically once i got a parse tree what should i do well based on what we learned we should call the visitors from top down we should really start visiting this particular ast node right the root okay so what we'll do is we're going to create some visitor for us creates a visitor for converting the uh parse tree into expression objects okay i was also say program because program is a top level right so now how do we uh which visitor should we uh which which visitor class should we instantiate well the top level is going to be and uh, program so we should really do antler to program okay so what i would do is i'm going to say antler to program over here oh, i'm sorry to program over here okay so now that's from another package right so now i gotta say prog program visitor is new antler to program okay initialize this visitor over here and then i would say so now once i finish once i've uh once i finish uh the, i will expect the visit method to actually return a uh and uh program uh to return a program objects so let me remind you again you can see antler to program over here basically since we instantiate this particular generic parameter for t into program so that means all the visit methods in this particular class uh antler to program is going to return a program okay that's something we covered in the previous uh tutorial video already so i would say program and then i'll say proc okay is it important okay program from basically expression okay proc will be program visitor visitor dot visit in that case i'll say antler dot uh, antler ast right so hopefully this uh confirms again what we said in the previous tutorial the reason that we created the visitor classes the main purpose the sole purpose really is to convert from the parse tree into our model uh objects okay so now after we have got this particular program so in that case well we can just uh, try to evaluate something right so now i would suggest we try to uh before i before i start coding this i would suggest i add another I add one more class to the expression package to make things more interesting for you okay so now and then i'll come back here so what i would suggest is i'll go back to uh package explorer and then i'm going to introduce a new class let's call that expression processor okay so now let me just uh get my notes to it and then we'll start programming that course uh programming that particular uh class over there it's not very long okay but it'll be interesting to see basically the idea about that class will be we're going to evaluate our expressions if they are type correct and again the best way to for designing this class is to have a visit visitor pattern to do it but i'm just trying to code something quickly just to show you so i would say expression uh processor okay it's a normal class and then it's simply in the expression class right so now let's see how we can do it so now let's see there will be two attributes over here the list of expression because we want to evaluate we can evaluate a list of expression so so in, import the list from the utility expression over here i would say list and also let's also have a map okay 
So I'm going to say public. So use of hash map, uh, use of map is very uh, a very standard data structure in compiler course. So I want to show you just a, uh, one use case over here. So map. So I would say string and also integer. I'll talk about what exactly this is supposed to store in just a moment. I'll say values. So this is so-called symbol table. Okay, it's a very standard name. Symbol table for storing the storing values of variables. For example, you can if you can recall the previous test case over here. Let's say even though this is not type correct, I'll just uh, make one example. So you can see as soon as we process this particular line over here, we know that i this particular variable should be of value five. So that's why i5 should be stored into this particular values uh, hash table. So we want to make sure later on when we actually mention about i over here. So what should be the value of i? We have to look up that particular hash table and know that it should be five, right? Of course, let's not worry about this particular type error. You'll be reported anyway. So now let's go back to uh, Eclipse and let's see how we can program the body of the method. Of course, mesh should be included. Okay, so now let's just uh, choose it. Okay. And then I should really spell string correctly. Okay, so now let's, uh, first of all, let's uh, have a constructor to initialize both attributes. And then I'll say expression processor. And then I'll have list of expression to be handled. Okay, in that case, uh, expression over here, that's good. And I'll say this uh, list is simply assigned to list and also initialize the empty map. It's assigned to new hash map. Okay, so now the compiler can infer these types, so I don't need to put it. Okay, so that's a constructor, very easy. So what I want to do is to really get some uh, evaluation for our expression uh, list. So let's say, first of all, we have a public uh, method over here is going to return a list of string. Eventually, when we want to report the evaluation result, each evaluation result, for example, I might say, uh, let's say for this particular case, I'm, for this particular line, I would say i plus j multiplied by 3 is whatever result it is. For example, 23. I'm making that up. Maybe math doesn't actually work. I'm just saying uh, the result should be presented as a string. Uh, should be begin with the actual expression in the source language uh, in the source input and say is and then whatever result that we evaluate. Let's see how we can do this. Get evaluation result. Okay, let me just call that method here. Of course, this method will be called by the main program. That's why we want to get interrupted a little bit to define this class first. And then I'll say a list of uh, string. And then I would say evaluation will be just a new array list to begin with. And again, I don't need this uh, type over here. And then eventually I'll just return evaluations. Okay, like that. So now let's think about how we can do this. You, we first of all we're going to go over the list of uh, the list of evaluations one by one, right, from left to right. And then I'll simply say for you can use it for each loop. Each one of them, it will be an expression. Expression E, a member of the list, right? You can see the list is simply uh, over here. The list is a list of expressions. So each one of them should be an expression. And then I'm going to uh, actually distinguish between them. So now we want to say, depending on which one we're looking at, if the expression, for example, is an instance of variable decoration. In that case, we don't really do any evaluation. For example, in this case, if for this particular one, we should really add the value into the hash table. We should say i5 should be added into the table. Similarly, for this particular line, we should not really try to evaluate, but instead we're going to say j7 should be added to the hash table, right? We're going to add two pairs into it. And then when we reach lines like this, we should evaluate. Okay. So now we should say if expression e instance of uh, variable decoration. 
And in that case, what we should do is we should do a cast. So that's why this is not a very good design. To really avoid casting, you better use the uh, visitor pattern for a better design. So now I'm going to say variable decoration. Okay, let's say decoration is variable decoration and then E over here. And then I can say values that put, right? Oh, sorry, not compute, put. Okay, and then I'll say put over here, and then I'll say decoration.id, decoration.value, right? You can also look up to see how the variable decoration class was defined. We did that in the previous tutorial video. And once I added it into the hash table, I can look it up later. Otherwise, if it's, it is not a variable decoration, that means we should really try to evaluate. So now the else part, okay, I'll put a comment for you. So that means, E would be instance of uh, different possibility. It could be number, it could be uh, variable, it could be addition, it could also be subtraction, right? So all these can be uh, evaluated. So now I would simply say over here, string input will be uh, e.toString, the first part. So that's why I actually said I should really try to implement a two string method for certain uh, expression classes. Now you will see why. And then that'll be the first part. And what about the second part? We want to evaluate, for example, number numbers easy. How do we evaluate variable? We should look up the hash table. And for addition and subtraction, that'll be done recursively, right? In that case, we need a recursive helper method. So I say integer result is get evaluation uh, let's say make it shorter. Eval result in this case e. I'm gonna define that in just a moment. And then after that, I'm gonna say evaluations dot add. And then I would say input, which is the source expression, will be for example the string i plus j multiplied by three. That's a source expression uh, output. Uh, sorry, source expression uh, display on the console. And then I'll say is. And then I would say the result which is integer, so that'd be the evaluation result, right? That's the idea. So now I'm gonna create this particular private uh, method that's recursive, okay? That one is also easy to do. You just have to think about what are the base cases and what the recursive cases are. So I would say private int, okay? Maybe I can make it a little bit up over here so that easier for you to see. Okay, so private integer, and get eval result over here, expression, right? And the expression might be of different instances. Again, you gotta use a long list of uh, instance of check. Again, the visitor pattern would be a much better choice for this particular implementation. Integer result will be zero just to assign, uh, initialize it, eventually return the result. We expect that to be reassigned at some point. You can say e instance of number. How do we evaluate a number? Well, just return whatever the value of the number is, right? You can say number num will be, do the casting first, and then e result will just be none dot none. Okay, none is just the attribute. Sorry, just called, called it the same name as the attribute, but hopefully you can see what I'm doing here. Else if e instance of variable over here, and now in this case, I'll say, variable var is variable e, okay? And then I can say result is assigned to, so now what should I do? I should really get the corresponding value from the hash table. That's why having this symbol table is very fundamental. I would say this is also very important to understand. You might need it a lot in different cases in your projects or later assignments. So now over here you say values dot get. In that case, var dot id, right? Just the name of the variable want to get it. Okay, apparently it is typo. Okay, after variable, we can also think about addition and also, uh, also multiplication. Let's do addition first. E instance of addition. In that case, well, we should really recursively evaluate left hand side, recursively evaluate right hand side, add them up together. First of all, you would say addition add would be addition and then e. And then you would say integer the left should be recursively calculated. So I'm calling the same method again. And then add dot left. 
and something similar for the right. I'm just going to copy and paste. Okay, left and right, and then with the result is simply left plus right. Okay, we're almost done. So now we have a final case for multiplication. So now the else case over here, I'll put a note over here. So that means E instance of uh, multiplication. Okay, it will be something very similar. If you allow me, I'm gonna copy and paste. Okay, I'm gonna say multiplication is gonna be cast by cast into multiplication. And then left and right, and now rather than doing plus, I'm gonna do multiply, uh, multiply over here. Okay, hopefully everything makes sense to you. Okay, so now we are done with this particular simple expression processor. So now we can have some usage of that for our main program of the compiler. Let me now go back to expression app over here. Okay, and now let's see exactly how we can call this particular app class. Uh, how we can call this particular processor class in the app. Okay, so now this is where we were. So where we simply just create the program. So what we want to do now is to go over the program. And don't forget one thing here. Uh, if you just go back to the antler to program over here, remember we got semantic errors, which means if the variables was not was already previously declared, you're trying to declare that second time, third time, there should be an error. Or if you actually try to, uh, I had a document in another class anyway. And the second error would be, if you try to refer to a variable in the expression that doesn't ex uh, that was not declared, that's the second error. We want to avoid those. We have test cases for that. So now I want to say, if there's such errors, I'm going to print them out. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and evaluate the expression, right? It wouldn't make sense for you to go ahead and evaluate the expression if your program has type errors like this. So I would say if program visitor dot semantic errors dot is empty, right? It's simply just a list. If it is empty, that means there's no error. Otherwise, we, that means there are errors. In that case, I should print them out. How do I print them out? Each one of them simply just a string error. So you can go to program visitor dot semantic errors, right? So now you can see semantic errors. Remember, it's simply just a list of string. Each one of them is simply a string. So now I would simply say system out dot print line. Of course, you can also print to the standard error if you wish. Okay, so that's in the case of error. But now what if there's no error? In that case, we want to print out the evaluation result. Expression uh, processor that we just defined, let's say EP, new expression processor. And now what list of expressions should we pass? Remember, we simply just got this uh, particular after visiting from the root of the abstract, uh, after visiting from the root of the uh, parse tree. Now we're getting back a expression package model objects of type program. So now in this, in this case, we can simply say proc over here. And if you, uh, let me just double check with you. So now if you go to the program class that we did previously, it does have a list of expression. You can see many things interconnected together. So that's why after the entire tutorial, once you type out all the source code yourself, hopefully that can, you really want to re-emphasize your understanding by maybe uh, doing part of the exercise again and try to understand how everything worked together. It's really crucial. Okay, so now I'm gonna say program dot expression. Okay, of course I gotta spell it properly. Dot expressions up here. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over all the expressions over there. Okay, I can say string evaluation and then it's gonna be a member of EP dot get evaluation result, right? So basically get, evalu get evaluation result as we just defined is going to go over all the expression that's being set to it and then try to evaluate them if uh, they are, uh, if that can be evaluated, of course, right? Like a variable, that, uh, variable reference, addition, subtraction, uh, sorry, addition, multiplication, and etc. And now I'm gonna say line, and then I'll say evaluation. Okay, so now this is basically what we have uh, we can do. So now we are done with the first version with the uh, uh, main program over here. We're gonna test it together with uh, all the test cases we had previously, test zero, test one, and test two, right? Test zero actually got 
basically some uh, grammatical error. Okay, so that means we should not even bother to check for semantic errors. Test number one does not have any grammatical error. However, it does contain semantic error. Test number two, if you review it, that one uh, neither has uh, grammatical error, nor does it have it uh, had the uh, uh, semantic error. So it, all the evaluation can be output. So now how do we do it? Okay, let's try to do it from Eclipse first of all, and then I'll show you how you can export the current project and uh, as an executable jar, and then we'll do it from the command line for completeness. Okay, you should know both. Let's now, first of all, set up the things. Okay, so now you will first go to run, and then you will say run configurations over here. We're gonna config for this particular project, okay? And then go to Java application and double click, okay? So now this is a new configuration, we give it a name. So let's say over here, it's gonna be uh, Antler example, okay? Let's say visitor, okay, we're doing the visitor. And then now for the program arguments, you can think about this as a command line arguments. Since we only allow one command line argument, right? If you remember, okay, I just couldn't show right now. But it will be the first one. And click on variables, go to uh, file prompt, and then say okay, and then apply. Okay, so now let's try maybe test number two. That's the one that should really output the correct result, right? So now if I just say, uh, okay, hopefully I don't have any error over here. Okay, uh, how about the main class? For the main class, that would be basically expression app, right? Okay. That's basically under this particular project and we got this particular main method to run, okay? Apply, and then you say run. When you say run, it's gonna prompt you for actually for the uh, uh, file name. And then I want to go to maybe desktop, go to workspace, and go to visitor, go to source, go to tests, go to test two. And then if I say open over here, and now it's going to generate the correct output for me. So now this is the first time we actually saw, we actually see how our compiler will work. And especially let's just double check these uh, these guys over here. That will actually make sense. Because now remember we said before, precedence, uh, our grammar looks to be ambiguous from what we learned from the lecture. However, because Antler, if I remind you again, for Antler over here, because we put this particular production first, so that would be considered as higher precedence. So let's see if that's really the case. So our grammar is not ambiguous, negative. So now let's say i plus j, five plus seven, 12. i multiplied by j, the second evaluation, 35. So now this will be done first. So five plus seven times three, 26, makes sense. i times j, uh, 35 plus three will be 38. So everything's correct. Okay, so now I wanna do something different, okay? Let me also try test number one. So test number one is actually going to give you some report from the semantic error, right? Because you can see test number one here. You can see, uh, sorry, hopefully that's a little bit, uh, okay, anyway, so you can see, see it. I'll just uh, read it to you. You can see the problem is in line number two over here, you can see we are trying to declare i the second time. Also in line number four, we are basically trying to refer to k that was not previously defined, uh, that was not previously declared. Okay, so these are the two semantic errors, but every uh, every line is grammatically correct. They, they, uh, they can always be, pro uh, be produced based on the grammar that we define. So let's try again, run. And now if I try test one and say open, that's pretty good because now it tells us these are the error messages, right? Apparently, I actually got <laughs> some typo over here. Why don't I, uh, actually it's not a typo, I should really get a space. Let me fix that, shall we? So let's go to our antler to expression over here and then one of the errors we set. Variable uh, already, okay, so now we should put a space over here, shouldn't we? Okay, let's put it there and then so now, question for you, do we have to regenerate all the grammar files? Of course we don't have to, because now we only change classes in this particular expression package. On the other hand, if you had to change the grammar file over here, then you have to regenerate everything. Okay, it's a quick check for you. 
go back here and then if I try to run again test one so now you can see that's much better right error variable I already declare to two does it make sense so now you can see line number two over here one two line number two one okay this is position one position two is talking about this particular I already declared right in two two and then also in line number four and column six line number two, four one two three four five six in k k was not declared previously right and also line number five and column four one two three four and this particular i it was declared already right it was previously declared already so you shouldn't really try to declare i again so that's really good uh, reporting right so these are semantic errors they are not syntax error just be clear okay what about test number zero let's see if test number zero will make sense to you if i click on that you can see apparently everything was fine except for line number three as we said previously right for line number three here you can see over here after this particular identifier i only got an equal sign and this should not be allowed by the grammar because according to the grammar, after a particular ID, you should have colon to declare the type, right? So that's not grammatically correct. Let's see what our program would say. What we really expect to see is this. Because syntax error or grammatical error is much more severe than semantic errors. If you got any grammatical errors, you should really stop parsing right away. So you should not proceed to actually report other semantic error. Let's see if that's the case. So now if I try to run again and say test zero over here, you can see somehow the error message here, the red one is actually saying uh, line number three over here and call it number two, one, two. So it's talking about J equals over here. It's saying somehow you don't have any alternative. There's no production for that. That one makes sense because over here, you can see uh, according to the grammar, you just cannot produce. You can only say ID colon. You cannot say ID equals. However, see what this is. So that means even though after this particular syntax error, right? Grammatical error, we still report this particular line to say line number two. Oh, by the way, not only that you actually got a uh, grammatical error, also you got some semantic error. That's actually not true. That's actually not appropriate. You should not. You should never try to mix the two together. If there's any grammatical error, only report them and let the user fix it right away. Semantic errors are something that is simply stop you from any uh, further semantic analysis, but they should not be mixed together. So mixing these two messages together is not so good, okay? So what we really want to have is something that's a slightly more sophisticated to say, uh, let me tell you exactly uh, roughly how we should do, and then I'll do the executable jar and then we are done for this tutorial video. Let me go back to our uh, main program over here. You can see over here, we only say if the program visitor has no semantic errors, right? In that case, we'll try to evaluate. But now we didn't have any check to say when the parser was actually trying to, uh, this, uh, let me, this line specifically, when the parser was trying to parse for the start symbol, if there was any invalid uh, part of the input that cannot be parsed, then we should really stop parsing right away and report the error, right? That's something we didn't say. So it seems like our error checking me mechanism is not good enough. We want to improve this, okay? That's the, that'll be the focus for the next video. But before I end the current video, I would like to show you one more thing, okay? So you, you already know how to run the uh, compiler from the input program, uh, from the console in the Eclipse. I want to show you one more, okay? You can also try this on your prison lab machine uh, or any uh, other machine you like, which supports command line. So now what I will do is I'm gonna right click on the project and then I would say export, okay? And then I'm gonna say search for jar runnable jar basically that's what i want okay i would say it would be advisable before you do that okay you want to clean your projects quickly click on the project uh, click on the project and go to projects and say clean otherwise sometimes uh exporting to the job runnable job might fail sometimes okay so i'll right click and say export and then i'll go to search for jar over here 
and go for runnable jar and then next okay first of all for the launch configuration i'll simply choose the right project okay that's uh, the run configuration if you remember the uh, command line uh fire uh, fire prompt that we set up okay i'll just uh, put it here and then for the export destination over here let's say putting the same project okay i'll go to desktop workspace and and then visitor go under how about source okay i'll put it just uh, right here okay and then uh, I would just say save and then finish okay that's fine you would just uh, say okay okay this particular job is actually uh, stored over here oh maybe I forgot to give it a name right so now can I just rename it over here let, let me rename the executable job very quickly let me say uh, let's say expression visitor okay just rename it so now i want to run it from the command line okay let's see where i am so now in i mean that particular uh visitor projects dot dot so now i do have that particular job over here so now how can i run it okay java minus job expression visitor job and then uh, now if i simply run that okay so that one is telling me uh usage uh, file name over here. Of course, it could have be been improved if I just uh, put a new line uh, there. I can uh, you can put a new line later. I'll put it now, and later on when we rebuild the job later, you can definitely do it. Okay, uh, if you simply improve it by saying file name uh, slash n. Okay, that will actually help. Okay, but that's for now. We can live with that. And then so now it seems to be working. So now what I should do is I should really say uh, invoke the same thing, and then I should just say tests. Let's say test, let's say 03, uh, test 2, dot txt. If I do that, that tells me these are the console output, right? You can see just like an executable program over here, just executable job. And if you like, you can also run the Linux, uh, maybe like an executable shell script. And then you can actually put this particular command line, uh, this particular uh, command into the shell script. So you can uh, abstract it using just maybe compiler. And the compiler is not expecting this particular argument, right? You, you learned this in your previous uh, C and Unix course. I'm going to leave that to you. Okay, let me try one more. I can say test one over here, right? So that's one is reporting error over here, right? It's very working pretty well for our compiler. So hopefully now you can really appreciate what Antler can do for you. And again, you really, really want to understand the flow chart over here, right? What's happening right now is we are basically saying input file and then running the jar and then producing something to the command uh, to the terminal okay that's basically what we're doing okay okay so now that would be uh the complete picture for uh let me just go back into eclipse make a very quick con uh, conclu uh, concluding remark so now for this particular project antler example visitor we have done that already okay but now there's only uh, one more thing I need to do to make it to make it complete. We have to improve this particular error over here. Again, you should not try to print uh, grammatical error and also semantic error at the same time. Semantic error should only be reported when there's no syntax error. Okay. So now how can we improve it? In the next video, we're gonna see how to do some more appropriate error checking.